Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. Let me, Father, we just thank you so much. This weekend we've had the privilege of joining with the school, and we thank you for the fundraiser that, was, that took place. We thank you for all the people that were there. There was far more than we expected. We thought there would only be 150 people, but there was over 200, so we're just grateful for all the fellowship that we had and the fun that we had there that night. And we praise you for the funds that were gathered. I don't know how much was there, but just thank you again for the opportunity that for the teachers and for our church members to be there and the opportunity that we have to evangelize and, and share the good news with, through relationships that are built. This morning, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have as a body to come together and sing praises to your name. You are a great and gracious God. And when we come together, it gives us an opportunity to love one another, in which we are fulfilling your one another commands. It gives us a chance to bring and lift you up, to recognize that you are the one who reigns over our life. And we are your servants. May we not forget that when we leave this building and return to our places of work, that we are not the king of our life, but you are. Help us to see that and keep our eyes focused upon you throughout the week. Give us boldness and courage to yield to you when our conduct screams to do the otherwise. This morning, Lord, as we center around your word, help us to understand your truth. Help us to remove distractions that will bombard our mind and take us away. And help us not to focus upon your word. And as your scripture is read this morning... Give us clarity of thought. We might follow along. Allow your word to seep into our hearts. That you'd use your word through the Holy Spirit to conform us into the image of your Son. Thank you, Lord, for not abandoning us and leaving us, but to continue to work on us, which you state in your word exactly that's what you're going to do. We are not a finished product yet. So when we look in the mirror, may we take confidence that this is not the final end result. And we look forward to that time when we will be complete in Christ. Bless our time together today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to encourage you to open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. You're familiar with this passage. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 is our scripture reading for today. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, give us insight into your word this morning. Help us to understand your truth, that we might apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. How are you progressing? Progress can be defined as forward or onward movement towards a destination in space or time. We evaluate our education, our employment, even our relationships by the progress that has been made. Imagine what no progress would look like in each of these areas. 
It's the 10th year of college. It's your 10th year anniversary at an entry-level position of employment. It's the 10th year of dating the same person. Has there been any forward movement towards a destination? To the outside observer, this would be unfortunate, as it should be to the person in each of these areas. The Apostle Paul writes to the believers at Colossae to encourage their progress in Christ. Paul had never visited the city of Colossae, but he knew of some of the inhabitants. He knew a man by the name of Philemon, Onesimus, Epaphras. All of them had learned about Jesus Christ from the Apostle Paul. Their lives had been turned upside down, or we might say had been turned right side up upon believing in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Paul had heard of these believers' faith. He had heard of their testimonies from Epaphras and how they turned to the living God from idols. Paul also heard about the way that they were living and also the threats of false teaching and the false teachings that were spreading throughout the area. There had been progress. But how do Christians stand against false teaching? Well, here's the test. That's a test that we all want to know. Or perhaps we don't want to face, but it will come in our lives. How will you stand against false teaching? How do we know we are believing the correct things? After all, there are so many different people out there claiming to be correct. How can we know that we are correct? Isn't that the height of pride or hubris? Today we look at the Christian's progress. In chapters 2, verses 4 through 8, we recognize the need for progress in verse 4. In verses 5 through 7, then, we see the nature of progress. And then finally, negative progress in verse 8. All of this is important for us as followers of Christ. For the Christian life is never to be stagnant. It is a constant growth and maturing as we focus upon Christ. So look at verse 4. Now I say this, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. We start off in our first point, the need for progress. As Christians, we are to continue to mature. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, we're told, let us go on to maturity. There's a sense, there's a call in which we are not to be immature, we are to grow. We are to move forward in our life. And if we are not making spiritual progress, then we are opening ourselves up to be moving astray, or drifting, as it states in Hebrews. But Paul is, Paul's warning is against being deluded or deceived through persuasive speech or arguments. How much does it take to persuade a person into something that they are already attracted to? Make an appeal to the desires of the eye or the desires of the flesh, and how easy is it to persuade somebody? Or perhaps make the appeal to pride. How easy is it to persuade a person through pride? Hey, there's nobody greater than you. You don't have one of these things. Wouldn't this look nice on you? You don't have these shoes. This shoe, set of shoes will look great with your outfit. And look, everybody would talk about you. Yeah. And pretty soon you find yourself taking out your wallet and buying it. It looks so good. Or perhaps the flesh. Yeah, I would like to have that. That will make me complete if I have that. After all, just one more bite wouldn't hurt anything. You know the old saying, a moment on the lips, forever on the hips. Ah! Well, if our eyes are focused upon Jesus, then we're walking on the right path. But when our eyes cannot be focused on two things at once, so here's a simple test. Take your eyes and look at me. Now, since you have two of them, this should be an easy test. 
Take one of your eyes and look at your feet. But keep the other eye on me. Now come on. You can do this, right? One eye on me, one on your feet. You see, wherever your eyes are focused, that's where your attention is too. When we keep our eyes focused on Christ, we are moving in the right path. And that takes us to our next point. The nature of progress. In verses 5 through 7, Paul says, For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and your steadfast of faith in Christ. Now, Paul's current state is one who is looking forward. He says that he rejoices to see your faith in Christ. Now, how had Christ changed these people? What took place in their lives that transformed and changed them? Now, I want to think about Onesimus for a moment. And Onesimus is not the main individual in this book. Perhaps you remember the events of Onesimus' life. Or perhaps you don't know who Onesimus is at all. So let me explain who Onesimus is. Onesimus is a slave. He is a slave of a man by the name of Philemon. And one day, Onesimus wants his freedom, so he wishes to leave and run away from his master. Of course, as a slave, he has no money. So he steals from his master to run away. And where does he go to? He goes to the capital of the empire, Rome. Rome had about a million people in Paul's day. Now, a million people in a city may not seem like a lot to us today. When we have cities like L.A. and we have cities like New York. But remember, they didn't have sky-rise buildings. So a million people all huddled together and spread out over a large piece of land is a lot of people. And besides that, out of that million people, it is estimated that over half of the people that were there were slaves. So Onesimus packs his things up, steals to get there for his traveling expenses, and heads to Rome where he hopes that he can just blend in the population. And lo and behold, he comes across this individual by the name of Paul, who happens to be in jail at the time. So how he meets this prisoner in, of Paul, who is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with whoever will listen to him while he's in prison, and he hears about this guy who's Jewish, who came and died on the cross and was resurrected three days later. And Onesimus hears how he didn't just die on the cross, but he died for everybody's sins. And he came to redeem mankind from those sins. So Onesimus recognizes that if he died for his sins, he would also have eternal life. Onesimus believes and becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. But then he's faced with this task of returning to his master who he wronged. You see, Christianity doesn't just change your relationship between you and God. It also changes your relationship <clears throat> between you and your fellow man. Onesimus knew that he had wronged God because of sin in his life, but he goes, oh no, I also wronged my fellow man. And who did he wrong the most? His master. He had stolen, he had run away, and he recognized that the punishment for this crime could be a horrible beating at best, and at worst, death. What is a follower of Christ to do in this situation? Well, if you wish to find out what happens to Onesimus, read the letter of Philemon, and you'll find out. Paul's desire is to be with them to inspect the, or excuse me, the Colossians' progress. And he uses two military words when he says, he says, though I'm absent with you, I wish to see your good order and your steadfast of faith. I desire to see your order. Meaning, what does it look like? What does your formation look like? Are you in good order? And then he says, you're steadfast. Meaning, do you have a solid front? Are you firm? Are you resolved? And these two words would mean more to his people of his day than it means to us. But in Paul's day, what was marching through the streets on a regular basis? The Roman military. One of the signs of the Roman military is they carried shields. 
They paraded themselves, not in a sense of, hey, it's a parade, let's get some candy. The, the Romans came in, and it was, everybody, you better be paying attention. Because the Roman soldiers were not playing games. So when they came and they were orderly, huh? when they were orderly, their formation looked a certain way. Their shields, when they lined up in a row, shield by shield by shield. One guy was not out in front and another far behind. All the shields were lined up, one beside each other. And in fact, there was another guy behind where they would have a spear right here. So if you were out of line, they would march forward. And here they come. Bam, bam, bam. They were not out of order. They were steadfast. They were resolved. They were not going to go anywhere. They were unmovable. When they lined up, they created a wall, a solid front that was stable. Again, their shields were side by side so that those who were behind them could have a sword or a spear that could make sure that whoever was in front that needed to disperse, they would disperse quickly. The church was on solid faith. They preserved the message that Paul taught them and they practiced it. False teachers and their message had not yet achieved any real success. And the Apostle Paul's, I want to see that you guys are lined up properly. I want to see that you're walking in a way that's steadfast. That you take Christianity seriously. I want to see this. How would you inspect your progress? Are you standing fast? Is your faith well disciplined? Our inspection leads us to a standard. In chapter, or excuse me, in verse 6, the, just the very first part of this, the Apostle Paul says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus as Lord, or Jesus Christ the Lord, Paul's referring to the moment that they received Christ. So we just have to ask ourselves, how does a person receive Christ? Paul is referring to something that they all get. He goes, as you receive Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? In John chapter 3, we have a conversation that's taking place between Jesus and Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was one of the religious leaders of Israel. And he approaches Jesus at night so their conversation could be private. You see, there was a conflict that was taking place between the Pharisees and Jesus. What authority did Jesus have going around teaching the people about God? That was the Pharisees' job. It was their responsibility to teach people about God and what they should believe. And yet, here you have this guy by the name of Jesus. He's going around teaching people about God. And the people are believing him. And so Nicodemus comes to him and acknowledges that Jesus is a teacher from God because no one can do the miracles that Jesus had been doing unless that individual comes from God. But what Nicodemus really wants to know is how can a person be right before God? How can any of us stand before the creator of the universe and be accepted? Have we been good enough? Have we done the right things? And if so, what are the right things that we need to do so that we know that we can say, I know I've done what's right and God will accept me. This was good enough. So Jesus responds to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, what? Well, he doesn't say what, but we would say, what? What in the world are you talking about? Nicodemus doesn't understand the statement, and the reality is, neither do a lot of people today. So Jesus recalls a time in the history of Israel that Nicodemus would understand. A time in which Israel had sinned against God. And God sent judgment upon the nation of Israel for sinning. And it was one of those huh, judgments that we could definitely relate to. It was, in a sense, a plague of snakes. 
And the snakes were everywhere. Can you imagine being in a, in a home where snakes are under your bed? Snakes are in the cabinets. Snakes are in the refrigerator. Snakes are in the bathroom. Everywhere you go, the slithering snakes come out. And they're not snakes that you would pet. These are snakes that see you and bite you. And the problem with these snakes is they would make the people sick and die. And the people are wailing because they're sick and they're dying. And the little kids go, look, there's a snake. And parents are saying, stay away from the snake. And they're getting bit. And they're dying. Once again, because the children of Israel have sinned against God. And so God tells Moses, here's what I want you to do. Make a bronze serpent, put it on a stick, and hold it up to the children of Israel, and walk around and tell them, just look up at the serpent on the stick, and they will be healed. It's that simple. Well, what do you mean it's that simple? It's as simple as believe the Lord God. Believe what He says, and all will be well. That's called faith. Do you believe what God says? Will you trust what God says? For Nicodemus, he's going, okay, that's true. Many people looked up at the snake and they were saved from their sickness and death. But the truth of the matter is not everybody looked up at the snake. And how can that be? How can not everybody look up? And Christ says, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, the point is that he's pointing to Nicodemus. Jesus Christ must be lifted up. Faith is believing what God says, trusting that he will do what he says. And what specifically does God say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Will you believe God? Will you accept Jesus? Will you trust Him? That's the question really put to Nicodemus. Jesus died on the cross to take away your sins so you could stand before God holy and righteous. There is nothing that you can do. There is nothing that you can bring before God because God has brought everything to you. God has done everything for you. And this is just called grace. This is the standard by which the Colossians had received Christ. Having reminded them of their faith in Christ, Paul now charges them to walk or live according to their faith. This reminds them of their standard. Just like with Nicodemus, now Nicodemus knows. And you might say, well, what happened? Did Nicodemus believe? Huh. Well, once again, I'm going to tell you to read the Gospel of John if you want to find out what happens to Nicodemus. But you're going to have to read through the whole thing to get to the end to find out whether Nicodemus believed in Jesus or not. We get to this next part, and we see in the exhortation, the last half of 6. Paul says, so walk in him, so walk in Christ, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Paul uses the word walk as a metaphor for the way that we conduct ourselves, our behavior. So how does a person behave or conduct himself in Christ? Paul describes four things that picture the conduct of what it means to behave like a Christian. And this is important for us because we should be going, all right, am I progressing? Do I behave this way? Is this part of my life? The first thing he says, having been rooted, it's the image of a tree that is planted and firmly attached to the soil area. Winds may blow, a tree may sway, but the tree is firmly planted. Christian, are you firmly planted? Or are you constantly being replanted somewhere else? For the believer, we are secure in one location. Now, he's not talking about a city or a town. He's talking about 
in our faith in Christ. We are, sta- we are not unstable, but we are stable because of our position in Christ. So we are rooted in him. We're also built up. So he switches from, a, from one metaphor to another. He moves to that of a building metaphor, of a house being built up. And we've all seen pictures of an area where there is no houses that were built, and then all of a sudden we see the construction that takes place, where a place, is re- place that was a forest, and then all of a sudden it's cleared out, and we see a dwelling that is there established. Life takes place. A house is built. And in the, from the foundation to the framing to the walls that's built, we see people that start living there. He says, you're built up. A home is a picture of dwelling of life. And we are built up in him. And the third, if you're taking notes in this, you've got rooted, built up, and then established or strengthened. It means we are confirmed or we are secure in our faith. Wow. You understand what you believe. I know, doesn't mean you know everything there is to know in the Bible, but this one thing I know. I know that Christ died on the cross for me and has given me eternal life. I know that. I'm trusting that. You say, well, I don't understand some of these other things. I get that. I don't know everything there is to know in the Bible. I'm still learning. In a sense, you might say, I'm still being built up. I'm still progressing. That's the right place to be. But I do know that Christ died for me and rose again from the dead. That I'm firmly established. And you probably noticed that each one of these verbs is in the past tense. It's really pointing out that God is the one who's at work in our midst. He's the one who has rooted us. He's the one who has built us up. He's the one who has established us in Christ. So we move to the fourth one. It says we are bounding, overflowing in thanksgiving. Now this is not a private thanksgiving, nor is it an attitude of, in which we say, I just need to be grateful. It's a public display of thanks. Thanks that's directed towards God. You're in Colossians, but I'm just going to ask you to turn over to chapter 3 and look at verse 15 through 17. Here it says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. That's what we do when we first start off in our services. We come together and we sing. Now, some of us sing out like our life depends upon it. And maybe some of us who are sitting beside each other say, I wish they wouldn't sing out like their life depends upon it. That's why I sit in the front by myself. So all of you are not punished by my singing. The point is, it's not how well you sing. There's an attitude. There is a point in which we are to sing and praise God. And we do that collectively as a group. We are abounding. We cannot help but for that to be part of who we are. Men sing of the praises of God. We do that. Singing is not a woman's thing. It's a Christian thing. The nature of progress is for us to move forward. We must be on guard against anything that would hinder our progress in our Christian life. So we move to our last point, the negative progress, in which the Apostle Paul says in verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Paul tells us, look out, beware of people who will enslave you. That's what it means to cheat you or to take you captive as booty. They will enslave you through philosophy, through empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world. Well, so I would ask and say, where would you 
expect or where would a person go today to find these things? Where would you be faced with philosophy, empty deceit, traditions of men, the basic principles of the world? Where do you study philosophy, untruths, the traditions of men? Need I say it? Would you pay for such things? I would say yes, you probably do. Would you be willing to take a loan out on your house for such things? Most likely you do. Most likely you've been encouraged to put savings away for such things. Because you've bought into an idea which, if you don't have one of these things, you will not succeed in life. Huh. Is that true? Because philosophy is so wonderful. Man's wisdom is so great. The understanding that is there to be gained, we cannot live without. Is that true? All of this that we've read stands in contrast to the last few words that the Apostle Paul says in verse 8. And not according to Christ. Not according to Christ. We measure everything according to Christ. For Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. Now, let that statement sink in. Now, I did not state that. These are not my words. These are Christ's words. And if these are Christ's words, we are stuck for a moment. Because either Christ is wrong... He is not the only truth. He is not the only life. He is not the only way to God the Father. Or he's just flat out a liar. Or Christ is crazy. Or perhaps there's another option. If Christ is correct, if he is who he says he is, if he is the way, should we not follow the path that he's laid out? If he is the truth, should we not listen to that truth and absorb it and put it into practice into our lives? And if he is the life, should we not latch on to it with both hands and say, I want life? That is something that we would want. Now, Amy has recognized that Christ is right. And today she comes to be identified with Christ through baptism. Now, what is baptism? Baptism is nothing more than a public declaration of what a person already believes. In the New Testament, Christ tells the disciples, go and make disciples, make people, once they accept Jesus Christ, make disciples, make other followers of me, baptizing them, like we're going to do today, and teach them all the things that I've taught you guys. So pass on the truth that I have taught you, pass that on. That's why we meet together. We're not hearing about my political point of views, which nobody cares about. Even my family members don't care about. I wish they did. The only things that people care about is what the Word of God says. That's why we meet together. People don't care about my hobbies. I wish they did. They only care about the Word of God. Right? So baptism is just a point in which we're following obedience. We become believers in Jesus Christ. And people say, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And a person says, yes, I have. They come forward to be baptized. And they take a step forward and they say, I want to be a, identified with what and who Jesus Christ is. And so in what takes place here is a person is being identified in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the death, he died and he was buried for three days. So upon coming into the water, they are submerged into the water. 
So they disappear for a moment. Christ came, up, came alive three days later, and a person arises out of the water. That represents the new life. They come out of the water. That right there is a, what we call a silent, if you will, testimony. Now, when the, first, when the church first started, there were thousands of people who were saying, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to be identified with Him. And the apostles and the disciples were baptizing people left and right. And thousands were added to the church. Now, you figure that out. That takes some time in order to baptize people. Right? You're going to see that baptism, the actual act itself, happens pretty quickly. But one of the things we want to make sure is we make sure that a person fully understands what baptism is. It doesn't help you in your relationship as far as making you righteous before God. It's not a work that says, all right, now I am better than I was before. It's a step of obedience. It's a step of saying, I recognize that Christ is my Savior, and I, want my, and I am publicly telling everybody that I'm a follower of Jesus. That's it. We tend to tell little kids to wait until they're older, until they're able to make the decision for themselves. Because oftentimes little kids are quick to want to do things when they see an adult that they admire or they love. And they say, anybody want to be baptized? And a little kid may jump up and run up here and say, oh, I want to do this because. Now, if I was here with, at the school chapel, I would have a lot of little kids that would say, yes, we want to be baptized. Because of who I am at the school. I have an, an, an alternate name called Jungle Jim. And the kids think that's just the greatest thing in the world to have Jungle Jim come and teach them. And so they learn all kinds of wonderful things. So we're ready? Okay. All right. I'm going to take this off so I don't get electrocuted. Anybody else want to be baptized? I got the water on Okay. I know not everybody here has been baptized. I know some of you are thinking about this and working this through your mind. doesn't matter how old you are. It's a decision each person has to make on their own. Let's close in a word of prayer. We are having a potluck today. That means everybody heads over to the gym and you are welcome to stay for food and for fellowship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the testimony that Amy has presented for us today. She's choosing to follow you. 
and, and faithfully walk before you. Lord, we recognize that in the Christian life there's, there's no perfection. We, we acknowledge that. We strive to follow you and follow your word that's laid out there for us. And we yield ourselves to you. May it be seen in the action around us, around those that are our family, our loved ones. And the body of Christ that's here. We love you, Lord. We bless the food that we're about to eat together. Thank you for the family and friends that are here today. In Jesus' name, amen.